We'll ask our panelists if they have any questions or comments for Dr. Plowman. Well, I'll start out. Um, I keep thinking about the fact that parents have their own genetics and they don't pass them all on to their children. There's only 50% similarity, right? It sounds to me as though you're saying um, the only thing that matters about parenting is whatever the genetics of the child have um, elicited from them, as though there was no independent effect of the parent's own individual variation based on genetics and their own life experience. Um, so, because you've emphasized so heavily the eliciting function of the child. I wonder if you'd say something about that. Sure. I think part of the problem is that um, uh, in a talk like this, where if you think that was too long, it, it was whittled down about two-thirds from what I started with, you know, you're kind of forced to emphasize certain aspects of it. And what's, it, it's not very novel to say parents affect kids environmentally, which is what you're going to talk about tomorrow. But I was trying to say that parents, parenting does correlate with the kids' outcomes. And what's novel is to realize that there's some genetic mediation of uh, that. And, but I'm not trying to say that it's all genetic. But I am trying to say that given that design, it's most likely the way that's going is that parents are responding to genetic differences in the kids because in that study, in most of these studies, the twins are kids. It's a children, twins as children's design. But in Sweden now, David Rees has gone on to do the complementary design to get parents who, you know, average age 40, who are twins, who have children, who are adolescents, because that's parents as twins design. And that would emphasize the genetic influence on the parenting more independent of the kids. You and I, people have been doing that, haven't you? Or have you done it yet? Well, that study's been going on for probably six years or so, eight years or so. And there are some reports coming out from it that also suggest that if you look at parents as twins, there's genetic influence on parenting. But again, can. it's not to say it's all genetic. There's a strong environmental component to all of this. And Eleanor's, uh, you know, mea culpa, I was, when I just, I was looking at my watch and noticing I was behind schedule. So when I got to that last part of my talk, saying to what extent is there genetic mediation of parenting as it relates to kids' outcome, I only emphasize the genetic Mediation, And that example I gave you was the one that showed the strongest genetic mediation. There are many other examples where genetic mediation was much weaker. So the news is there's genetic mediation there. But I shouldn't take away from the fact that a lot of the relationship is environmental, as you'd expect it to be. But I'm sure you'll redress the balance tomorrow. <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> Dr. Kagan. I don't mean this to be a technical point, but I think it's important. In human development, so children only, since once you get to be 18 months, you're thinking, and therefore you're constantly comparing yourself with all your siblings and your relationship, I don't think there can be any shared environment, and that it's always shared because in humans, unlike animals, you are conceptualizing your role. And, and so the question to you is, do you really think you can have any variance for shared environment for psychological traits? I don't think there can be any shared environment. Um, well, I would argue that most developmentalists assume that environmental variation is shared. Now, I know we'll get some disagreement on that, but it was only the clinicians I know of who focused on difference, differences in experiences among children in a family. They would talk about processes like scapegoating, for example, where one child is, you know, scapegoated for problems in a family. But people haven't studied the environment that way, as if they recognize that what's ever going on is experienced differently by two kids in a family. I'll give you some examples that I think are, are really very shocking, like asthma. Do you know asthma is highly heritable? There's been half a dozen twin studies in recent years. In early childhood, asthma is highly heritable, like heritable. The environmental influences are completely non-shared. Adoptive siblings correlate zero for 
for that, for asthma. But what are our theories of asthma? The big theories are pollution. It's like how near to a motorway you live. Well, two kids in a family live near to the same motorway. So this non-shared environment points to new ways of thinking about the environment. Like with asthma, what's important is not what two kids in a family share. Whatever it is environmentally, it's what makes two kids in a family different. So if you re recognize that that's the key, then it seems to me you'd want to study differences within a family. Uh, no, I'll just go on one second. We agree completely. My question is is that you do want to study the the family. Mine was a theoretical question, Robert, that I don't see any defense for human psychological traits for two or more children of the notion of shared environment. That it's never shared because the children are conceptualizing their properties, their relationship to their parents, and in their heads, they are not in the same environment. Non-shared non environment is powerful. I don't believe there's any shared environment for human psychological traits. That's what I'm saying. Hmm. Well, I, um, I, I doubt that uh, that's the story we'll get tomorrow. Would you say, Eleanor? I'm having so much trouble hearing. I see. What, what Jerry said is too much feedback. Yeah, it is. Here. It is difficult okay. to hear each other up here. But yeah. um, maybe we should just go on then. Okay. I'll. Uh, I like that. So, yeah. <laughs> Here's a question from the audience. Would the panel comment on studies that support the proposition that the greatest environmental influence on children's development is peer relationships, not parental influences? Oops. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if this is uh, an extremely clever question, but uh, uh, an issue I skated over in terms of non-shared environment is a book in 1998 by Judith Harris called The, the Nurture Assumption. Um, the Nurture Assumption being this assumption that, um, unlike Jerry, I think Judith Harris says most people assume that the important environmental influences are those early in life that ought to be shared by two kids growing up in the same family. Because, I mean, you do experience the same parents. I take Jerry's point exactly, though. Do you experience the same parents? Yes, you have the same parents. You know, and say if they go through divorce. Well, you've had divorce, right? Well, not necessarily can experience divorce of their family, of their parents, very differently. So anyway, Judith Harris, her book was emphasizing the importance of non-shared environment, really the topics of my talk, um, nature of nurture and non-shared environment. And the novel aspect of her book, though, was to say that uh, those of us who were looking at the family environment for non-shared environment were barking up the wrong tree. At, at the end of our NEAD study, we had to conclude that the family environment, when you control for genetics, wasn't really the source of non-shared environment. I mean, not much. So Judith Harris is saying that peers are where it's at because siblings do, to a large extent, experience different peer groups. Now, there, that hasn't been tested much. There's a couple of studies now that are suggesting that, yes, peers do account for some of the non-shared environment, but um, it's probably not the silver bullet that explains everything. Well, when it comes to uh, designs that aren't genetically sensitive, you certainly can see very large socialization when it comes to gender differentiation. So I don't think there's anything wrong with thinking that there is peer influence. I just don't think it means that there's very little parent influence. Okay. That's another question from the audience. Uh, with what degree of certainty can we say that the genetic identity of identical twins is absolute? Yeah, there's been a lot of talk about different types of twins, but now with um, DNA work, all of our twins um, are routine markers where you get, um, we, we typically use a, a bank of 12 DNA markers, and we just do this through the mail, actually. You know, you just have a Q-tip, and you rub the inside of your mouth, and you can get enough DNA there to do hundreds of DNA markers. So we routinely then put all of our twins through um, a multiplex, it's called one, one Go, and you genotype these dozen or so highly informative markers. It's sort of what, in a way, what DNA fingerprinting is about. And identical twins on DNA. Eric Kandel made an important point, but just in passing, and that is, he. It, 
um, the environment doesn't change our DNA. There can be mutations. But what he was talking about are changes in gene expression. And that's a hugely important area of research. But the neat thing about studying DNA is that DNA is causal. Everything else we study in biology, neurotransmitter levels or whatever, it's correlational. When you show that a neurotransmitter level correlates with anxiety, it's causal. As Eric Kendall and Jerry were saying, it can be behavior causing the biology. But with DNA, its correlations are causal because nothing changes that DNA um, structure. And so identical twins are identical except for rare mutations. There's one, one pair of identical twins who are opposite in sex, believe it or not, because it's actually just one gene, this one region on the Y chromosome that's sex determining. And there was a mutation very early twin pair. So yeah, you can get these very aberrant situations where identical twins are different genetically. But after looking at um, really thousands of pairs of twins, uh, the identical twins don't differ on a single bit of DNA, even if you sequence them. Uh, do you believe that the lack of heritability in many disorders lessens the necessity of testing for illnesses within families? Less makes it less necessary to look for uh, apparently family histories or oh. something like that. Um, well, with breast cancer, it's a sad case in a way because um, GPs were just sort of getting the message there's genetic influence and they ought to screen for it. If women go to the GP, they will, when they're asked about their family history, they'll be, they get asked about breast cancer. But unfortunately, that's one of the least heritable characteristics around. And, but it's probably worth asking about, even though it's the least heritable characteristic, because there we do you know, there's huge issues right now. What if you are one of those one or two percent of women who have that particular BRCA1 or 2, where you are at risk for that very early onset, very severe, bilateral, usually ovarian cancer. It's a very nasty cancer. If you could predict it early, there are options that you have. They're not happy options, but um, it's probably, you know, worth knowing about it, even in a case where it's not very highly heritable like breast cancer. But in general, most is useful, say in the case of alcoholism, you know, even though it's, you have a, it's a, like a five-fold greater risk if you have a first-degree relative who's alcoholic. And so it doesn't mean you're going to become alcoholic, but it means if you go out and drink as much as your, your mates do, you're more likely to become alcoholic than them. And so it's probably worth knowing that. And um, it's, I would say, um, uh, makes it more important to be screening for these traits. Okay. Another one here. Heritable. Well, um, you know anybody who's done that? In England, much to my surprise, there's a, a, a person, fortunately, who just died recently, no connection, I'm sure, who really says there's no such thing as talent, musical ability especially. And I, in getting involved in that a bit, I've been quite struck by an important point. This is related to the Is Genes Destiny. Um, I have a friend, Nick Ch youth orchestra where they take young, talented people and give them you know, terrific chances over a summer to work with the best conductors. He's convinced you can take someone with essentially no talent and make them into a professional musician. But in that same cohort, you'll find some kids who are just mind-bogglingly good. And with the same amount of training, they're off the scale. And so I think that's largely what it's about, um, that there certainly are genetic contributions. Um, it's amazing how far we can go environmentally. Okay. Well, one last question. We, we don't have our ethicist here. I'll count on the audience here to provide the ethical question. Uh, can scientists afford the old-fashioned view of separation of science and politics and democracy? Given the ways in which decisions are made, don't science ha scientists have an obligation to anticipate the way their work will be taken up? Uh, for example, genetic screening gets used by insurance. I'll certainly defer to my more senior colleagues on this question. I mean, my view on it is I'm glad to be working in an area of behavioral sciences where people care. 
I mean, you know, where you could do damage. I, I want to do dangerous science. I want to do science that can make a difference. So much of behavioral science as nobody ever reads or cares about. So this issue of nature and nurture is important to people, which is why we have to worry about how these results are used. Um, I can't recommend strongly enough, though, these are just the sorts of issue he's dealing with. But basically, you can see I'm backpedaling and copping out here to defer to <laughs> my <laughs> colleagues here, because these aren't issues, you know, that are specific to me. That's correct. And Dr. Kagan is eager to jump in here. At my old age, this is the one issue that still generates a great deal of passion. Uh, in the evolution of our species, as we all know, some and we developed an ethical sense. It's part of our genome. And that changed all the rules because our ethical sense moves us toward ideas of justice and equality and taking care of the weak. And therefore, it is very dangerous, as many people have said. Wittgenstein said it beautifully. When it comes to ethics, it's totally independent of facts. And so, science is beautiful. We've had a wonderful day, and tomorrow we will have an equally beautiful day, helping us understand ourselves and the world. My God, it's perfectly lovely. Let's not get greedy. Humans want to believe that their politicians and the people in power are using something rational because, as we all know, that position of privilege has changed. In the 10th century, the church decided what was what shall be the law of the land. They advised the kings and philosophers took over. And this is not meant as either negative or Science is now the arbiter and therefore the average citizen decisions being made in state houses or in Washington. But then let science be the arbiter. It has to be based on something on a position that has the privilege of power and truth. And I think that is very dangerous. Look, let's take one example. We could take many. I believe that there's no question that adult men predisposed to mate with many women. In other words, that adultery is in our biology. But that does not mean that in a November referendum, which said, since we have learned from biology that adult men are strongly disposed by their genes to be adulterous, should this not be a crime? I think Americans in their wisdom, and the last point, and in doing that, they are not being silly irrational or sentimental. What they're saying is, Mr. and Mrs. Scientist, that is a very interesting fact. Really interesting. I choose not to use it in running my society. That is perfectly rational. Um, we'll give Eleanor the last word. Here. Since I am the most senior of your colleagues here, um, I'd like to say a little bit about my experience doing work on gender differentiation. Um, I have had people say to me, do not publish that finding. That will be damaging to the cause of women. And I had who is a hot feminist. I'm a feminist myself, but not quite as hot as she. Um, and we agreed. We will not suppress any findings 
because ultimately the truth will make us free. And I believe that is so, and that, that societies can make more intelligent decisions. As you say, Jerry, they may decide to ignore some truths. They probably in the long run will do better if they build a... I want to argue for science, and I don't mean to say let politics uh, go whichever way it wants to. Um, I think that um, we care very much about what the applications of what we find are, but that doesn't mean we ever distort them. With that note, I believe we'll let our panel go home and rest up for tomorrow. Thank you. Tomorrow morning.